There are a lot of atrocities that happen in the name of the authority of whatever you're believing in telling you to do something else. And you go along with it because of those societal norms. This is a powerful presentation because most people do not understand how evil they really can be. It seems like a lot of people that I know go, oh, my sweet mom or my sweet grandma or my dad is always so kind. I'm gonna give some illustrations throughout this whole presentation which are fascinating, so I highly recommend you guys at home and here kick back and really pay attention to this. These are some incredible experiments and some crazy things that have happened throughout history that are gonna be pretty shocking because whether you believe it or not, you can be evil. And understanding yourself can be extremely challenging. That's one of the reasons why we here go over all the different varied topics on how to become and stay and maintain a higher level of goodness. And it's obviously challenging. So we're gonna learn from these violations of spirit throughout this presentation, which are pretty phenomenal. What we're gonna discover is regular people shock torturing others, just regular, Joe Blows think it's okay to shock people until death. College students torturing other students because the authorities said to. Christians killing the, quote, undesirables. And concentration camps for innocent people inside of the U.S. and also outside of the U.S. that has happened in modern history that truly illustrate if we do not maintain that goodness with inside of us, we can do very bad. Things. And at the end, we're going to talk about some solutions. Now, the first one, which is fascinating, is called the Milgram experiment. And this is shock torture. And what we what happened in this experiment was in 1963, Stanley Milgram, he created an experiment to see if participants would follow orders, even when their requested behavior went against their own moral beliefs. Now, what they did here is pretty fascinating. It kind of gives an illustration of what was happening, and we're going to go into that detail in just a second. And of course, this is, uh, and many other slides are going to show how authority actually redirects our own inner goodness and our moral dictates. Now, what these guys did, unbeknownst to the participants, this guy was an actor. They hooked him up to these electric devices, seemingly electrical devices, and they thought they were going to shock him, and they believed that they shocked him. So what happened was, and of course it became famous and extraordinarily controversial, but it was done at Yale University by Milgram. He conducted this study, and what he wanted to do is prove that authoritarian figures can dictate the thoughts and beliefs of other people. So all he did was put on a, a white coat around somebody telling him what you're going to do is ask a series of questions to this person that's hooked up to electrodes. You're going to be able to hear them, but they're going to be in the opposite room. And when he asked the questions, if the electrode person gets the answer wrong, he has to shock them. And as every time he gets it wrong, the level goes up all the way until it's death. It's pretty fascinating. So as the experiment progressed, the participants would hear, they called them the learner. He would plead to be released. He would scream, talking about his heart condition, how he couldn't take the pain anymore. And once they reached the 300 volt level, the learner would, he would start banging on the wall, uh, to, demanding to be released until all of a sudden there was silence. And this is pretty remarkable because most participants Ask the experimenter, the guy in the white coat, the authoritarian figure, whether they should continue. And the experimenter would respond with a, a, the same series of commands, like, please continue, you know, in the authoritative tone. And the experiment requires that you continue. You know, whenever these people are like, oh, I'm hurting him, this is bad. It's absolutely essential that you continue. You have no other choice, you must continue. Th th these are very demanding sort of things for an authoritarian figure to say. And it is because we've been brainwashed so heavily, most people just went ahead and did it. If I can go back here just for a second, is that the result of this was the vast majority of people shocked or thought they were shocking the person into a heart attack. That is what the majority of people did until later, they ended up doing this. They threw a rebel into the experiment. 
who was also an actor. And because he was a good rebel, this good rebel did this. And this is amazing because later experiments conducted by Milgram indicated that the presence of the rebellious peers dramatically reduced the obedience levels. So whenever you, all of a sudden you have somebody that has a really good conscience and just says, no, we're not doing this. We're hurting this person. We're stopping. All of a sudden, the vast majority, 36 out of 40, said, oh, we're going to stop. But the experiment without the good rebel, they were just willing to do whatever the authoritarian figure said to do. That is a very scary situation whenever these are just random people that answered an ad to participate in an experiment. They didn't know anything. They didn't know the person. They're just regular Joe Blows and they'll shock somebody to death. That's a scary sort of proposition. Here's a famous picture of one of them, and he's questioning the guy in the coat. He's going, hey, like you can watch the movie. I think that's still on YouTube or BitChute or somewhere. You can watch this guy and others when he's questioning them. He's going, hey, I'm hurting this guy. We don't need to keep going. And what does he do? No, you must continue. Continue on, please. And what does he do? He's screaming at the other guy. Well, he can't see him, but he's screaming all this pain and all of a sudden he stops. There's no, nothing. He says, no, you need to continue. After he continues and doesn't hear the guy anymore, he just puts his head down. He's like, oh my God, I cannot believe I'm torturing this guy. But he still does it. A normal, regular, seemingly good guy and all of these other participants are too. They're just shaking their head. Oh my God, what have I done? What am I doing? It's pretty amazing. Now we're going to move on to the Stanford experiment. It's the prison experiment. Another crazy example of how we do not understand ourselves in most cases. That's why it's incumbent for us to talk about these topics and all the ones in this presentation so that we understand how we can be influenced. We can understand that there are some authoritarian figures that we need to have good rebels. And so what was the experiment about? This guy Zimbardo, he was a former classmate of the guy that did the previous experiment. And the researchers wanted to know how the participants would react when placed in a simulated prison environment. So this is pretty crazy what, what they ended up doing. They got 70 young guys to respond from an ad, and this is at Yale. These are all college kids. And it was a psychological study, and they were paying them $15 a day. Now, $15 a day was a good chunk of money back in the 60s. It was decent enough for a college kid. And so they just separated them, took a group, said, okay, random, you're going to be cops. Random, you're going to be prisoners. And it didn't take them long. Within 24 hours, there were some serious, serious things happening. And these are, are just good college students, just wanting a little extra money so they can buy a pizza and have a beer with their buddies at night. So these guys go in, they do all kinds of crazy stuff. They put on glasses where the prisoners can't see them. They actually build cells in the basement of a Yale dormitory. I think it was a dormitory or a classroom place, whatever. They built the prisons. They tortured them, put bags over their heads. They treated them very inhumanely. They locked them in closets. It got so crazy that they didn't have any choice but to stop it because these people automatically started taking on the role of authority automatically. Oh, I'm better and superior than you. And all they did was answer an ad. They just answered an ad. And because they were placed in a position of authority, it shows us how quickly the human mind will go, oh, I am over you. I am your overlord now. And that is a dangerous thing and something we should really realize. We have a lot of uh, overlords in this country and around the world that we need to be very weary of because the human psychology will allow people in authority to get very disconnected from the rest of humanity. And we need to understand that. And we have scientific studies like these that have proved it and real life examples, which we're gonna get into in just a minute. Now it just goes on to say that they, they ended up taking the 70 and taking it to 24. And it's just phenomenal what, what happened. And you can see where they were lining them up. And there's also a good movie, a good documentary on this too, which is be in the show notes if you have a real interest to see how quickly people can turn on their friends and their colleagues by being placed in a authoritarian type role where I'm locking you up. You are now my prisoner. People change and they change real fast, even otherwise good people. So you can see how they're walking them down the hall. It just gets really, really crazy. And the impact of this study was you actually see what we just talked about, that these people will do anything to somebody else if they're given the authority. 
So really, the societal norms dictate how most people behave. They are told it's okay to be this authoritarian police officer, and you're going to treat your colleagues this way. And of course, they took it far and way beyond the boundaries of what was expected. But that was part of the psychological experiment to see how far normal, quote, normal people will go. It's pretty shocking. Now, this next one is pretty interesting to me because this is just good old Catholic Christians killing uh, a lot of undesirables. It is a shocking thing that has happened in our recent history. And we think, oh, no, Christians don't do any harm. Muslims, well, we think in the Christian nation that, you know, they do, uh, but to them, they don't. Hindus, the same. Uh, there are a lot of atrocities that happen in the name of the authority of whatever you're believing in telling you to do something else. And you go along with it because of those societal norms. Just like this, they just round these guys up. This is World War II. What do they do? Just go take people from their homes. Take them. What are they going to do with them? <laughs> we all know what they did with them. Going to find them in the woods and wrapping their faces up, hog tying their hands. They're just standing around with all their buddies. You know, they just got out of uh, church probably uh, a few days ago. Now it's okay. And why would this be sanctioned or not somebody somewhere in authority stand up and say something? Like the Pope. The Pope would have been a great one because the majority of Germans were Catholic. The Pope did not say a word about it. The Pope at the time, nothing. What would happen if the majority of these soldiers are Catholic and the Pope comes out and says, this is bad. We do not kill our fellow humans. We don't do these things. It might not have changed the, the war, but it certainly would have had a massive impact on the level of death and destruction that happened. But no, this guy, he's just pious for everybody. Please. Oh, let's pray. I think it's a d disgusting illustration of what the human is capable of and why it is so important for us to understand what has happened and the experiments that have happened so we know ourselves so that we can be our own good rebellion. Now, this is pretty amazing. And we're going to get into some things real quickly that most people don't know. And we had concentration camps for our, quote, enemies. This is... Another fascinating testament to what men can do. The war's over. No more. We've declared peace. We're peace. We're peaceful. We're going to create commerce again. We're going to rebuild Europe. We're going to allow these Germans to surrender to us. We bring these Germans in to these camps. And this is what's crazy, is that they, they reclassified them as disarmed enemy forces instead of POWs because that was a legal technicality where they did not have to abide by the Geneva Convention. So that means they could torture them, do whatever they wanted to because of the little word change. Now, who was responsible for this? Of course, it was Eisenhower and all of the uh, other people at the top. No good rebels were amongst any of them. And this is it. This is just one picture that you can find. This is mostly erased from our history. We did not learn this growing up. I did not learn this in history class, that it was okay to take a million plus soldiers that the war is over. And what do we do? We pack them up in this barbed wire with soldiers running around all on the outside to make sure that they all starve to death because we did not want to spend the money to feed them. And plus, we wanted our revenge. We wanted our, our blood. It's a pretty sickening and frightening set of circumstances. And for the most part, none of them had any tents. You can see a few makeshift tents here. And as far as you can see, if you had a plane flying over it and there's a bunch of... Uh, clips on this that you can find. I don't know if you can on YouTube, but certainly Rumble and Bit Shoot and Odyssey, uh, you can find them, the real clips still. Now this is where it gets really interesting because all the other atrocities, you know, these guys were uh, put down their arms. They surrendered in, in the one before, but we still said, meh, that's all right. We'll still torture you by hunger. Japan bombs Pearl Harbor. Obviously we're going into the war. We're not going to go into did FDR know or did any of those things because there's a lot of evidence. But John McCloy, the Assistant Secretary of War, he remarked that, it, that if it came to a choice between national security and the guarantee of our civil liberties expressed in the Constitution, he considered the Constitution just a scrap of paper. Now, these are the top echelons of our government. So what does that mean? We say, oh, the Constitution just be a, a sheet of paper. Well, that means that us here today would not be able to gather 
as a religious organization. That means us together if, let's say, our Christianity was only dominated like it used to be by only Catholics. You had to be a Catholic or you died. If that was still in place, then we couldn't be here today talking about how we worship in our own way and how we peel off our own layers by going off all the, over all these topics to reach divinity. So if the highest echelons, the authority figures that run the mental experiment that we've already seen, and also the mental experiment that happens in this country on a daily basis, if our freedom of religion is just nothing, so scratch it off, throw it away, ball it up, whoo, trash. It's not good. Our freedom of speech, destroyed. Search and seizure. Come on, take whatever I got. It is very problematic that these people exist and how they operate and how these other experiments show that those people have an authority because of that psychology and they don't have the good rebellious soul inside them to fight for good, they will never guarantee our right to worship, to talk, to have our own papers, so many other things that are just critical for us to be absolutely aware of. These Japanese Americans, there were quite a few of them. And we took about, uh, I think it was about 120,000, a little bit more. We took them all their businesses, we took their houses, we took their cars, we took their clothes, we gathered them all up on trains and we put them all over the country. We had concentration camps all over the country. We built places like this on American soil for American citizens. American citizens, not some war criminal, but us sitting here because they had some idea that we may be connected to something halfway around the world. So they just collect everybody. Don't think for a second that that can't happen to us if we do good rebels so that we can worship and think and talk and debate and learn things with each other. This is what they did. These are U.S. citizens right here in the good old U.S. of A. And here they are getting off the train. Let's hurry up and line these uh, elderly ladies up just after we take all their things. And as a recompense later on, many years later, uh, we apologize and say, oh, we're sorry, U.S. citizens that we put in concentration camps. Here's a little bit of money, but oh, we're sorry you lost your... A lot of them couldn't go back to their homes. They were taken, their businesses were destroyed. They lost everything. Here's a little bit of money, now go about your way. That's a sad state of affairs, I would say. But also say that goodness can prevail, and it takes that good rebel. It takes the good rebel in all of us to stand up to things that are not right. And a good example of this is this famous picture during the World War where you have what we would say the good guys are us, and the bad guys are the Germans, and the Polish, and this happened in a couple of different instances where I believe it was Christmas Eve or Christmas morning, I, one, of the, one of those. Both sides call a truce so they can all enjoy a few moments of Christmas without shooting at each other. Somehow, a group of these guys get together. They were just shooting and trying to kill each other a minute ago. Now this minute, they're all laughing and playing for hours. But because the authority figures told them, no, nope, time to stop playing. Truce is about to be over. Y'all get back in the trenches because we're fixing to start trying to kill each other again. And that's exactly what happened. So these guys can instantly go, man, this is horrible. They can connect to that enemy, that perceived enemy. But because the authoritarian guy in the white jacket or the really nice suit that's been elected your leader tells you, hey, put the ball down. You're fixing to go kill that guy you're just playing with. But just for a, a brief moment, there was some goodness that happened. And the solution is we have to be anchored in goodness. Those guys could have easily said, I'm not shooting with them. I just hung out with them. They're okay. I'm throwing my arms down. There's no reason for me to go kill these guys because you said so. That's why we have to know ourselves and be willing to do whatever is necessary to make right happen. That it's not going to just magically happen on its own. We have to encourage goodness. We have to study ourselves. We have to go over all these topics we discuss on this channel. We have to seed and promote and water that goodness so that the atrocities at least don't have a great of a chance to spring up. One way to do that is be aware of every moment and promote your inner strength for good. We all get in bad moods when we say bad things. We say uh, something to somebody that was mean or we sometimes even inadvertently or accidentally hurt somebody's feelings from being too blunt or too aggressive. Or, uh, but we have to be aware. 
we have to catch ourselves. And that's difficult and it takes practice, but we can all do it. And we focus on many of these very topics just like we just talked about because we have to connect to the divine within us all. This is so important because we cannot bury ourselves with closed minds and separation. Those enemies on the battlefield, they weren't different. They were just young guys wanting to play some ball. But there was a forced, a false separation amongst them. We can all come together. We can lift each other up. And we have to be and surround uh, ourselves with good friends. We don't want the friends that go, oh, it's okay to go do all these bad things. Or do things that are bad to our body. Do things that are bad to our parents or loved ones or wife or husbands. We must surround ourselves with good people. So then our goodness spreads and invades and pushes out those shadows. And this is one of the most important people in human history. And we can do this with peaceful non-compliance. Like those guys could have easily said, I'm not, I'm not shooting anybody. Those students, hey, I'm not going to torture these guys. These are my fellow college kids. I'm not going to shock this guy. I can tell he's hurting. I'm just not complying. I am peacefully not complying. I'm not getting up trying to punch you or strike you or do anything. So I would say there's a lot that we can learn from Gandhi because you can change the world one person at a time. That means you, me, everybody that's here it takes awareness. It takes practice. It takes forgiving ourselves and it takes us every day and every moment working to put light on the shadows. Thank you all for joining us. I appreciate it. Join us here every Sunday at 1.30.